This is a series that I started the very first Sunday of the new year. So I think I can say this and you can understand why. At the end of an old year, I believe that we are encouraged by the Holy Spirit to take a spiritual inventory of our previous year. And when we are sincere and we take this inventory, we admit that there are areas that we have gained ground in Christ's likeness in the previous year. But if we are also sincere and admit there are areas in the past year we have fallen short. Now, one thing I've learned is, and you've heard it before from me, God's definition of willpower is you give him your will and he'll give you the power. So it's not like saying, I'm going to change that this year. We need to surrender. We need to ask him to assist us, remind us of things. But I think that's why the Lord called this New Year's series the challenge. Because he's giving us the challenge of being sincere and as the old song says, remember it, to be like Jesus. That's all I ask, to be like him. And that's what God's plan is for all of us, to be like Jesus. Now, he may have individual plans, like you wouldn't want me sitting over there for what Lucas does. I, you would not want that. And so we need to take seriously what he is saying to us. Zeke Thompson had been the director of a zoo for many years. However, he knew in order for his zoo to remain competitive, he must bring in more and more animals. But there was one problem. It's called finances. So he thought he would develop a plan B. And for quite some time, his plan B worked until his gorilla died. To keep up the appearance of this full range of animals, he hired a man to wear a realistic looking gorilla suit. Now, it was the imposter's first day, and he tried. He had done some studying of what gorillas did, and he tried to do that. In fact, at one point, he tried to jump up on the wall, as a gorilla does, you know? Problem. It didn't work. And he tripped. And he fell into the lion exhibit. The imposter began to scream and struggle to get out, as you can imagine. He was convinced his life was over, and suddenly the lion drew very close to him. He expected to be devoured, and the lion said, Be quiet, or you're going to get us both fired. <laughs> An imposter. God doesn't want his people to be. He doesn't want us to cut and paste 
so we look like Christians from the outside. He wants us to be Christians, authentic, growing in Christ's likeness. Aren't you glad you're not the same way you were last week? That brings us to part two of the challenge. Are we converts or disciples? Roman numeral number one, you know I usually have a three-part sermon. It's not because I was trained that way, although I was trained that way, but it just seems to fall naturally that way. So let's call this from convert to disciple. When we talk about converts, Matthew 18, verse 3, Jesus said, unless you are converted, did you hear him say the word? Unless you are converted, and become as little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Jesus makes it clear to us that if a person is to be accepted into this other kingdom, he or she must be converted. In the biblical sense, Conversion means a turning from sin in repentance. Did you hear that? In repentance and turning to Christ in faith. It's like changing the road you're on. The scripture tells us that there is a broad road that leads to destruction. We can't stay on that road. We've got to find an entirely new road. And it involves in turning our back on the world system, on its anti-God, anti-Christ values. It involves a complete turning or a pivot, an about face and we enter the narrow gate that leads to life. Now, this is important. The whole purpose of conversion is to bring men and women and children into a right relationship with God. Amen? Amen. That's why Jesus came. And that is the reason for which he died. Now, you can call it saved, born again, converted. Somebody said to me, why do you talk so much about being saved or born again or converted? I'm glad you asked that question. <laughs> because I lived for many years in a gospel-saturated country and knew nothing about being saved or born again. We can't assume that everybody does. You know, sometimes even people that come to church don't understand. And so that's why. Because I've had people in the past say, what do you mean by that? Oh, hallelujah. And so we need to understand that it's why Jesus came. In 2 Corinthians 5, 19a, Jesus tells us, or Paul tells us that God, I love this, God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself. 
Most of us say Jesus was on the cross. Yes, he was. But do you remember that Jesus said, I and my Father are one? Can you imagine such great love that God who said to Adam and Eve, you need to obey, and when they disobeyed, he takes their place to bring us back to himself? God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself bringing us into a relationship with him again. My mother and her sister (coughs) used to uh, argue sometimes. But I was always so happy when they reconciled with each other because They were family. God brings us into a relationship with himself through Jesus Christ. But there's something we need to remember about converts. And it is this. Converts are new believers. When we get, you're afraid to cough anymore. Everybody's going, oh! (laughs) When we come to Christ, it's the beginning, not the end. It's the beginning of a walk. It's the beginning of a journey. It's the beginning of a relationship. We all started out as converts, but we cannot stop there. Converts aren't bad or wrong. But on the spiritual journey, converts are like babies. And so, There's nothing wrong with being a baby. The problem comes when we don't grow and when we don't change physically and spiritually. I'm sure you've seen on TV, I don't even know what channel it is, but they always have some kind of thing on and you've probably seen the ones where You know, the child is 20 years old and still very small. Then we know there's something wrong physically. An infant needs to grow up. When a baby acts like a baby, isn't that cute? But when a 35-year-old acts like a baby, it's not so cute anymore. Think of it when Paul writes this in 1 Corinthians 13, 11, He says this. When I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought or I reasoned as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things or I put the ways of childhood behind me. Paul speaking spiritually. You know, We get saved or converted, and we need to start eating spiritually so that we grow and we can become followers of Jesus Christ. A follower of Christ is called a disciple. A disciple. 
I know many, many churches, ours included, provide ways that someone that has just been converted or has rededicated their life to Christ can grow. And we need to. We can't leave it just to a person. You, it's like the old saying, though, you can take a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. But a church, the pastor, and you need to help provide ways for others to grow. We have disciple classes. We have Bible study classes. And that's good. Because sometimes we need somebody to say, wait a minute, let me show you something that God showed me in that scripture. Has anybody arrived yet? I, I need to find out what you've done because I'm not there. We are growing, but you can't put this under your pillow and by osmosis it's coming in. It doesn't work that way. We need to read. We need to study, we attend, and fellowship with one another. When I go before the Lord, when it's my time, he's not just going to say, well done, good and faithful servant, because I was converted. Or even because I've been walking with him but because I share the good news so that others can be converted, so that others can grow in Christ, so that others can be disciples. And I got news for you. It's true for you too. A disciple is a follower of Jesus. A disciple is a student. Now, you don't have to raise your hand. But there are people that actually like school. School was different in my day. You took a test once. If you didn't pass it, oh well, you better do better on the next one. I happen to like school. I enjoy study, and this, has been a light to me for 45 years. Good times, bad times, and sometimes he tells me what I don't want to hear. Man, he's taken my nose off, my ears off. But if we're serious about being like Jesus, we want to move from being converts to being disciples, followers of Jesus. The word disciple, like the word discipline, comes from the Latin word discipulus, which means pupil or learner. Remember how Jesus would say in Mark 2.14 was one of them, come follow me. Come follow me. A disciple is a follower. One who trusts and believes in the teacher or the rabbi and follows the teacher's words and the teacher's example. Therefore, and this is important, in order to be a disciple, one must be in relationship with the teacher. I really liked my sixth grade teacher. Her name was Mrs. Hartzell. This was back in Niles. 
Her husband was the band director for the city schools. And one summer, we always used to go to Lake Erie for a week or two, and one summer, I was walking down the beach and I heard a voice, and I thought, that sounds familiar. And I looked and walked up. Mrs. Hartzell and her family had rented a cottage just down from where I was. Now I knew her as my teacher. But as I was sitting there talking with her, her daughter, it's amazing what you can remember and what you can forget, right? Her daughter, Holly, was probably about five or six, was being difficult. And Mrs. Hartzell told her own daughter the same things she told to us when we were in school. And I thought, oh, wow, I'm getting to know my teacher outside of the classroom. Getting to know my teacher a little better. That's the way it is with Jesus. It's an intimate, instructive, imitative, I like those three eyes, instructive, intimate, imitative relationship with the rabbi, with the teacher. Being a disciple of Christ means being in relationship with Jesus. Seeking to be like Jesus, not cutting, not pasting. We follow Christ, now listen, to be like Christ. We follow Christ to be like Christ. I recently read an article by a man named J.S. Shaw. And he says this, the most interesting thing about the Great Commission is that it does not command us to make converts. It commands us to make disciples of Jesus Christ. And he went on to say this, converts change their religion. Disciples change their master. Converts follow a system, disciples follow a person. Converts build Christendom, disciples build the kingdom. Converts embrace rituals, disciples embrace a way of life. Converts love conversion, disciples love transformation. Kingdom culture. What on earth is kingdom culture? Jesus tells us to seek first the kingdom of God. Remember I said what Shaw said, disciples build the kingdom? Well, Jesus tells us first to seek the kingdom and then build the kingdom. Jesus told his disciples, the kingdom of God is where? It's within you. You mean living here on this earth with all this, this violence and, and lying and 
all of this all around me, that the kingdom of God is here, it's here. It's here. The kingdom of God is within you. Before anything else, there is a kingdom, and converts are the beginning of the way into it. It's like knocking on the door, only it's Jesus knocks on our door and then we knock. Kingdom culture begins when the Christian realizes that there is a kingdom of God and Jesus is king and Jesus is Lord right here, right now. Oh, there's coming a day, hallelujah, when every knee shall bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. But is it yet? If you saw any of the news this morning or looked on your computer, I think you'd have to say no. But it's here. It's here. He's king here. He's Lord here. And his desire is that his children follow his rule and seek his will. Lord means one who is the master, one who is the principal ruler, one who has dominion and authority. Does Jesus have dominion and authority? I think so. A man named Peter Forsyth said this, the first duty of every soul is to find not its freedom, but its master. But its master. Do you think that there are people that the devil is their master? and they don't even know it? Yeah. After the resurrection, the title Lord was applied to Jesus not just as an honorable or a respectful title. It became much more than that. Saying Jesus is Lord became a way of declaring Christ's deity. Remember Thomas's exclamation in John 20, 28, when Jesus appeared to his disciples after his resurrection, Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. Peter's sermon on the day of Pentecost contained that same theme. Let all Israel be assured of this. God has made Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah, both Savior and Lord. We've got to go beyond the fact that Jesus is our Savior. Is that good? Is it good that he's our savior? Hallelujah. But we need to be able to call him Lord. And Lord implies, here's a word for you, surrender. <laughs> I, I have to confess, even today, there are times when we play games. I like to win. Oh, when I was a kid, mm, mm, mm. I liked winning. But today, if we are going to make Jesus Christ Lord, 
then we've got to wave the white flag. We've got to surrender. To acknowledge Jesus as Savior is the affirmation of a convert, and that's good. But the disciple goes to another level and acknowledges that Jesus Christ is Lord and surrenders to his lordship. That's tough. And don't let anybody kid you. This whole idea of dying, denying and dying is not easy. It's tough. But God's spirit is there to help us. Jesus doesn't say, that's it, I wash my hands of you. That is our challenge. This year, to make Jesus Christ Lord more than we've ever allowed him to be. What does it mean to make Jesus Lord? Number one, he becomes our master. Some people don't like that word. Paul called himself a bondservant, a slave of Christ. We're no longer in control of our lives. Isn't that scary? We obey Jesus. Jesus said in Luke 6, 46, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and don't do what I say? That's pretty sobering. Making Jesus Lord implies absolute ownership. Peter tells us we've been bought with a price. If he's Lord of our lives, then all that I am and all that I have is his. I don't belong to myself. As Paul reminds us in 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. It implies unquestioning obedience. If he is Lord of my life, then whatever he says, I will do. What if I don't understand? Do it. What if it seems wrong to me? Do it. What if other people say, God wouldn't ask you to do that? Do it. I remember when God called us as a family into the United Methodist Church. We were in a Pentecostal church for 12 years. And people said, oh, I can't believe God would do that. I'm going to pray for you that you listen to God. I said, you're right. Just pray for me that I listen to God. The Methodist Church was having its difficulties even in 1990. It implies wholehearted service. If he is Lord of my life, wherever he directs me, I need to go. We sold the house that God got us when we were first married. We paid $39,900 for it. Hallelujah. It was a great house. And the Lord 
I thought he was going to get us a smaller house, although with four kids, I didn't know where we were going to put them. But I was ready to do whatever he wanted. Instead, he got us a house over by the country club, Trumbull County Country Club. I couldn't believe it. But there was a condition. Hold it loosely, because when I call it back, you need to give it to me. Four years we lived there. And then I became an elder in the United Methodist Church. And you remember how the Methodists used to be? Uh, you were itinerant. And so sure enough, one day I got the call. You're going to be appointed to Richfield. Richfield, where's Richfield? Never heard of it. So we sold that house. And we went to the most difficult place that I could have gone. The house was nothing like what we had. And there was in Richfield at that time a witch's coven. And the demonic influence up there was something I had never seen before. And uh, as if I didn't know it, after living there for a very short time, we found out that actually one of the persons who was a witch <laughs> lived in the home that we were living in. Now, if you think it's not real, oh, talk to me after the service. Wholehearted service. He directs me where I need to go. In Isaiah 6, verses 1, 5, and 8, Isaiah uses the word Lord three times. And he recognized that it was very necessary to make him Lord. It takes us out of our comfort zone. Oh, it does. The sovereignty of Christ can change our whole life. Fifth, it implies implicit trust. If he is the Lord of my life, whatever he desires, I accept, whether I understand it or not. Do you know how many times I've said that to him? Lord, I don't understand. And uh, I can almost see the grin. I didn't ask you to understand. I just ask you to obey. But we have to recognize that he's working out his purpose in our lives. Remember Job said, though he slay me, Yet I will trust him. And finally, number six, it implies certain reward. If he is Lord of my life, then there are some blessings that come with surrender and making him Lord. First of all, we have a purpose. I think that's the first thing I recognized when I accepted Christ, when I was converted, was the fact I had a reason to get up in the morning. I had a reason to live. 
I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future, Jeremiah 29, 11. He gives us direction. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your paths or he will make your path straight. Proverbs 3, 5 and 6. Strength. <laughs> oh, I found the older you get, the less you seem to have. And yet, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Philippians 4.13. How about confidence? We're not talking about self-confidence. We're talking about confidence in the Lord. The Lord didn't give us a spirit of fear or timidity, but of power and of love and self-discipline. He didn't make me afraid. Oh, are there times my knees knock together? You better believe it. We don't know if David's did when he stood before Goliath. All we know is he was obedient. He gives us peace. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble or meek in heart, and you'll find rest for your soul. Matthew eleven twenty nine. 29, Jesus says, My peace I give you, not as the world gives. How much peace is out there right now? If you're depending on the world to give you peace, Look out. Sixth, satisfaction. Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Psalm 37, 4. Power. John 14, 12. Very truly I tell you, whoever believes in me, will do the works that I've been doing and even greater works than these. Relationship. That is so beautiful. Do you think about that? The King of Kings and the Lord of Lords wants to be in relationship with you. I can't hardly fathom. Revelation 3.20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and eat with him and he with me. You get to sit down at the table with Jesus. Eternal life, John 17.3, and this is eternal life that they know you are the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. And finally, and believe me, I could go on and on and on. How about a legacy? Deuteronomy 7, 9. Understand, therefore, that the Lord your God is indeed God. He is the faithful God who keeps his covenant for a thousand generations and lavishes his unfailing love on those who love him and obey his commands. Doesn't get much better than that. Not on this side. Let me end with something that C.S. Lewis said. In the beginning, I think that many of us, when Christ has enabled us to overcome one or two sins that were an obvious nuisance, we become inclined to feel 
that we are now good enough. He has done all we wanted him to do, and we should be obliged if he would just kind of leave us alone. But the question is not what we intended ourselves to be, but what he intends us to be when he made us. Imagine yourself as a living house, and God comes to rebuild that house. At first, perhaps, you can understand what he's doing. He's getting the drains right and stopping the leaks in the roof. You knew those jobs needed done, so you're not surprised. But presently, he starts knocking the house about in a way that hurts and does not even seem to make sense. What on earth is he up to? The explanation? He's building quite a different house from the one you and I thought of. He's throwing a new wing here or there or putting an extra floor, running up towers, or making courtyards. You thought you were going to be made into a decent little cottage, but he's building a palace, a temple, and he comes to live in it himself. convert or disciple this year wherever you are on your journey with Christ may you get up, come ever closer and follow him more completely by surrendering by denying and dying. Oh, there's all kinds of benefits here and now. And if you have problems, guess what? He's the way maker.